our title of today's message, How to Stop Satan from Hindering Your Prayers. How to Stop Satan from Hindering Your Prayers. Again, last week we spoke about why our prayers have not been answered, why our prayers are hindered, and I showed you that it is not God that's hindering your prayers, but it is the devil that is hindering your prayers. There's eight things that we must do to stop the devil from hindering our prayers. Eight things. Number one, we must believe that God is not the one who made you sick, poor, addicted, depressed, or in trouble. That God is not the one that has brought sickness in your life. God's not the one that has brought trouble in your life. You've got to believe that it's not God. <coughs> and that's number one. Number one. And so let's look at James chapter 1, verse 12 to 17. It says, Blessed is a man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived. My beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Let me read it another way. Blessed is the man who endures temptation with sickness, poverty, addictions, depression, and trouble. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no man say when he's tempted with sickness, poverty, addictions, afflictions, depression, trouble, I am tempted with sickness, poverty, addictions, depression, or trouble by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone with sickness and poverty and addictions and depression and trouble. <laughs> But each one is tempted with sickness, poverty, addictions, depression, and trouble when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desires has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death, gives birth to sickness, gives birth to poverty, gives birth to addiction, gives birth to depression, gives birth to trouble. To realize that, that it is our giving and yielding to the temptation of sickness and of poverty and of fear and of depression and of trouble that gives place to these things in our lives. So who is the tempter? The tempter is the devil. The Bible tells us that the one who tempts us is not God. The devil is the tempter, not God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except which is coming to man. For God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will make the way of escape that you may be able to hear it. Let's read it another way. No temptation of sickness Poverty, addiction, depression, or trouble has overtaken you except such as is common to man. God is faithful, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted with sickness, poverty, addiction, depression, trouble, evil, beyond what you are able, not able to bear what you are able but with the temptation of sickness, poverty, addiction, depression, and trouble will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Maybe be able to stand up and endure it and stand up against it. So understand, he's not the one that brings the sickness, the fear, the depression, the trouble. But he's the one that gives you the way of escape. 
So number one, you've got to believe that God's not the one that is making you sick. That God's not the one making you poor. God's not the one that's bringing affliction and trouble in your life, number one. Number two, you've got to believe that God has already given you all things. You've got to believe that God has already given you all things. Second Peter chapter 1, 3 to 5, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, through desires. You believe, you have to believe that God has already healed you. You've got to believe that God has already provided for you. You've got to believe that God has already delivered you. That's what you've got to believe. You've got to believe that God has already done all these things for you. You cannot believe that he's going to do it. Saying, I believe God will heal me, God will deliver me, God will provide for me. You are in hope, you're not in faith. I want you to understand something. Bible faith is not blind. Bible faith demands evidence. Hebrews 11 one says, now faith is the substance of things for the evidence, the proof of things not yet seen. It's an accomplished fact. I want you to know that there's nowhere in the Bible that God tells us to believe without evidence. That's why Jesus came. And what did he come do? He gave evidence. He came with signs and wonders and miracles. Why? He needed to give evidence that he was the Christ. God does not demand faith in the absence of evidence. When God spoke to Abraham, God revealed himself to Abraham. God visited him and showed him the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. God revealed himself to Abraham. God did not demand Abraham to believe without evidence. God, that's why God said to Abraham, look into the stars. Do you see the stars? Can you number the stars? That's your evidence that I'm giving you evidence that your descendants will be as the sand is by the seashore. Why could he believe God? Because God had prepared, manifested himself to him. God had revealed to Abraham a city. The Bible says God had shown Abraham a city, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. God showed it to him. Abraham didn't believe God without evidence. God showed him evidence. God always gives you evidence. Our faith in Christ is not blind. His death and resurrection is evidence. God always gives evidence. I want you to know the evidence that by stripes you are healed is his word. His word is based on the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. God always gives evidence. Faith without evidence is not faith. It could be another religious faith, but it's not Bible faith. The Bible faith, the faith of God demands that you believe in evidence. Now that evidence is not what you are, is not your feelings and what your eyes could see. But your evidence is based on what God has revealed through his word. I have evidence. And my evidence is not subject to change. My evidence is eternal. See, if, if, you, if your evidence is how you feel, if your evidence is what you hear, if your evidence is what you see, that is subject to change. And not only is it subject to change, it can be deceived. Uh, that's how magicians work their art. Magicians use the sleight of hand to deceive your eyes. It uses your mind against you. That's how magicians do their thing. They use your eyes, what you see, what you hear, what you touch against you because what you feel, hear, and touch is subject to change. But I want you to know the word of God is not. And so you've got to believe that God has already given you all things, that God has already healed you. God's not going to heal you. God has already provided for you. He's not going to provide for you. God has already delivered you. He's not going to do it. Number three. You've got to believe that you received what you've prayed for. 
You've got to believe that you've received what you've prayed for. Mark chapter 11, 24. He says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You've got to believe that you've received it. What do you mean? You've got to believe that you've laid a hold of it. Just like I have this bottle of water in my hand, I believe that I have this bottle of water in my hand. Well, in the same way, I've got to believe that whatever I've prayed for, I have it in my hand. Why? Because God's already given it to me. I can believe that I've already received my healing because God has already given it to me. I, gotta, I can believe that God has already provided for me because God has already given it to me. I can believe that I'm already delivered. I can believe that I received my deliverance because God has already given me all things. That's number three. Number four, do not be anxious about what you have prayed for. Do not be anxious. You've got to stop looking at the symptoms. You've got to stop looking at the pain you are experiencing. You've got to stop worrying about if you're going to receive what you've prayed for or not. You've got to stop worrying about how long it's taking. You've got to stop taking thought and worrying about those things. James 1, 5 to 8 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. No doubting. What is doubting? Looking at the symptoms and the pain you are experiencing will cause you to doubt. And if you keep thinking on them, that's when you doubt. If you keep thinking about the pains, thinking about the symptoms, thinking about the trouble, thinking about the anxiety, thinking about the fear, thinking about the depression, thinking about what they said, thinking about what you saw, thinking what the doctor said, thinking, 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 you will doubt. And for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For he, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. You're going back and forth. You're looking at the symptoms. You're looking at the word of God. You're looking at, by his stripes you're healed. You're looking at the, the pain. By his stripes I'm healed. I'm still in pain. By the stripes of Jesus I'm here. I'm, I'm, my, my, I, st I feel like I'm losing my mind. God is not giving me a spirit of fear, but, but, but I'm so afraid. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, be anxious, take no thought for nothing or for anything. But in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, the shalom of God, that, that, that peace that passes all understanding, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. But you got to not take the thought. When the thought comes, you're sick. When those thought comes that you will always be sick, you will always be poor, you will always be alone, you will always be depressed, you will always be in trouble, you will always be addicted. You cannot give in to those thoughts. You've got to replace those thoughts, and you cannot think those thoughts away. You've got to replace those thoughts with the word of God. We look at Matthew chapter 4, 1 to 4. Matthew 4, 1 to 4 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Not to be tempted by God. God is not the tempter. The devil is the tempter. It's the devil that tempts you with sickness and poverty and fear and depression and trouble and all affliction and addiction. He is the tempter, not God. So he led him up to be tempted by the devil because Jesus had to go through what Adam went through and had to defeat the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. This was in Jesus' thoughts. It was a thought. But he answered and said to the thought. He answered and said to the thought. It is written. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, well, how do you know it's a thought? Because we know that the, when he took him up on the pinnacle of the temple, Jesus was still in the wilderness. And he told him to throw himself off the, the top of the temple. There was no temple for him to throw himself off of. But in Jesus' mind, he was on top of the temple. And then he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory thereof. What, how in the world, in the wilderness, he's going to see? He took him on an exceedingly high mountain. I don't care how high the mountain you were taken up. You're not going to see all the kingdoms of this world and their glory of them. It was in his mind. The temptation, you are tempted in your mind. That's where the temptation, you're tempted in your mind. And if you meditate on that temptation, it gets into your heart. Once that gets into your heart, then it will be conceived and become sin. So the, Satan put a thought in Jesus' mind. If you are the son of God, that's how subtle he is. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus didn't sit there trying to think the devil's thought away. He spoke to it. He answered the thought. And that's the problem. The thoughts for you to fear. The thoughts for you to be anxious. The thoughts for you to worry. The thought for you to be sick. The thought, for, you know, you start feeling a tickle in your throat. Oh, cold is coming on me. The thought. The thought to, I want you to know fear is a thought. Anxiety is a thought. To, taking sickness is a thought. You feel a pain and you start to think sick. The devil tells you you have cancer and you start to think cancer. The devil tells you you have diabetes. You start to think diabetes. You start to think that you're a diabetic. You start to think you're a cancer patient. But it's God, is Jesus didn't take the thought. Satan gave him a thought, and he didn't take the thought. What did he do? He spoke the word of God. Satan, it's written. And it was written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Satan brings a thought to make you sick. What do you do? By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. The thought comes from the symptoms that you are experiencing. The thought comes to tell you're always going to be sick. That you're going to die from this sickness. you got to replace the thought and declare by the wounds of Jesus, I was healed. I will live and not die by the name of Jesus. You sickness and disease, you're gone from my body. I'm healed. Devil, go from me. You don't sit there, oh, oh, my head's hurting. Oh, oh, the thought, the thought, the thought. No, speak to the thought. Don't take the thought. Speak to the thought. Number five. Believe you have authority to have whatever you ask in Jesus' name. You got to believe that you have authority. You have the right to have whatever you ask in Jesus' name. John chapter 14, 12 to 14 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, not might do, I will not say I will get around to it if I feel like it, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 16, 23 and 24, it says, And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Not he might give you. He'll give it to you if he gets around to it. If he can, you know, if, if he, if he, if he um, has, a, you know, has some time. He will get, do it. He will give it to you. He will do that the Father, he said. Until now you have asked nothing in my name, asking you will receive, not might receive. You will receive, not might, you will receive. That your joy may be full. You will receive that your joy may be full. How is your joy going to be full? By you receiving the answer to your prayers. Number six. 
You've got to know that the devil is your enemy. He's the one trying to destroy your body, your finances, your faith, your relationship, your peace, your life. You've got to know that the devil is the source of that sickness. The devil is the source of that trouble. Stop looking at people. The devil is the source of your poverty and financial struggle. The devil is the source of your anxiety and all your fears. The devil is the source of the troubles in your life. Oh, you guys just always like to blame the devil. No, I don't always like to blame the devil. It says if the shoe fit, let the man wear it. The shoe fits. <laughs> Second Corinthians 2.11 says, Let Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of Satan's devices and schemes. John 10.10 10 says the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy. I've come that you may have life and that you may have life more abundantly. That Jesus sets the record straight in Acts chapter 10.38 when it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. God opened, Jesus opened blind eyes, unstopped deaf ears, caused the mute to speak, healed sickness and disease, raised the dead, caused the cripple and the lame to get up and walk. That's what Jesus did. He fed the hungry. Jesus calls them the hungry to be fed. That means hunger is from the devil. It's an oppression of the devil. Death is from the devil. Sickness is from the devil. Blindness is from the devil. Deafness is from the devil. Muteness is from the devil. Being crippled and paralyzed is from the devil. Because he went about doing good, healing all those oppressed by the devil. First Peter chapter five, eight to nine says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, he tells you straight plain who your adversary is, who your enemy is. It's the devil. Walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you. He wants to devour your finances, devour your health, devour your peace, devour your joy, devour your relationship. That's what he does. He's a thief. He's a liar. He's, he's, he's evil. <laughs> uh. This guy wants to say, he's a good for nothing, low down snake. <laughs> Satan shows no compassion. There is no compassion in the devil. The devil is evil, personified. The devil is not your friend. Ephesians 6, 10 to 17 says, excuse me, he says, who made the vow? He says, resist him. Don't pet him. Don't say, come little lion, lion, lion. Don't pet. He says, resist him. How do you resist him? Steadfast in faith, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. The same sickness, the same poverty, the same anxiety, the same depression, the same fears, the same trouble, all that you're experiencing, your brothers and sisters in Christ are going through the same thing. So what do you do? Resist him steadfast. Why do you need to know other folks are going through it too? So that you know you're not, you're not that special. To think that you and you alone is the devil picking on. No, the devil is out trying to devour everybody. As long as you are a son of Adam, he hates you. He hates the Adam. He hates the children of Adam. 
And then when the children of Adam become children of God, he hates you even more. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 17 says, excuse me, 10 to 13. It says, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the schemes, and the plottings of the devil who's trying to devour you, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. They are wicked in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand. You need the arm of God. What's the arm of God? Faith. You need faith. You need to know your righteousness. You need to know that you're saved. You need to know you have peace. You need to know these things. You need to know these things. You need to know what is the truth. You need to know that the word of God is truth. You need to know that you got to speak the word of God. You need to know you got to stay in prayer and don't give up on prayer. These are, your, these are the weapons of your armor, prayer, the speaking of the word, believing the truth, standing fast on what you believe, knowing that you are saved, that God has already saved you and rescued you. Satan has no right to annoy you. and You have already been set free and delivered and that you have shalom, you have peace, you have soundness, you are protected. You are sound and protected on every side. You got to know that's your armor. When you know these things, you know that you're righteous. You're right with God and that your righteousness is not based on what you did, but your righteousness is based on what Jesus Christ has done for you. Number seven. You've got to believe that the devil and all demons have been defeated already and that you have authority to cast them out. You have authority over them. You've got to believe that the devil and his demons are already defeated. Colossians 2.14 says, concerning the Lord Jesus, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us through the law, who was contrary to us, and, excuse me. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Ah. Uh, I wrote down the wrong scripture, excuse me. It's, a, it's a Colossians chapter 2, uh, 15. It says, having spoiled principalities and powers and made an open show of them. Colossians 2, 15. He made it, the, the King, New King James says, he disarmed principalities and powers and made an open show of them. Made an open show of of them. He disarmed them. You know what that means? That means principalities and powers have the weapons, the guns, the machine guns to kill you. And Jesus went and took the weapons out of their hands. He took the guns out of their hands. In other words, demons, principalities, and powers no longer have the weapons or the means by which to kill you unless you believe that they do, unless you give them that ability. He's disarmed them. They're disarmed. They're, they've been stripped of their power. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, it says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus said he's already been destroyed. Jesus has destroyed the devil. That word destroyed means to be put away, to make unemployed to abolish, to do away with. The devil is unemployed. And release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Luke 10, 17 to 19 says, Then the 70 turned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The demons are what? Subject to us. That means they are under us. When somebody is subject to you, they must do what? Obey you. He says the demons are subject to us in your name. How are they subject to him? In his name. 
in the name of Jesus. They are subject. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you, you children of God, you who name the name of Jesus, I give you the authority to trample, to walk on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Over how much of the power of the enemy? All of it. What power did the devil have? Well, Jesus showed us his power to make people blind, to make people deaf, to make people mute, mute, to make people dead, to make people sick, to make people crippled, to make people hungry. Jesus has given us authority of all the power of the enemy, of all of Satan's power. All of Satan's power is subject to us in the name of Jesus. But will you believe it? Do you believe it? We see Jesus further emphasized this in Mark chapter 16, 15 to 18, when he said, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. Now, these signs will follow pastors and apostles and teachers, those who believe. These signs will follow believers. Are you a believer? If you're a believer, these signs will follow you. These signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. Demons are subject to you in the name of Jesus. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means harm you. Poison and the venom of snakes is subject to the name of Jesus. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover in my name. Sickness is subject to the name of Jesus. Who? Believers. Unless you are an unbelieving believer, but if you believe on Jesus, demons are subject to you. Snakes are subject to you. Now, that doesn't mean you go get a cobra and go, here, cobra, cobra, cobra. Here, snakey, snakey. The snake's going to bite you, and you might die. That don't mean you go and drink poison. But I'll tell you what, if a snake bites you, you know that it can't kill you. And if somebody if you eat some bad food, you, it, you know that it should, can't hurt you. If someone tries to poison you, if someone says, ha ha, I poisoned your food, you go like, ha ha, <laughs> the name of Jesus is bigger than your poison. You don't sit there going, oh, no, oh, no, no, I'm poisoned. No, in the name of Jesus, whatever you gave me to eat has been neutralized by Jesus' name and shall not harm me. The authority and the power of the name of Jesus. Let's look at some examples in the scripture of this. Acts chapter 3, 6 to 8. In Acts chapter 3, 6 to 8. In Acts chapter 3, 6 to 8. It says that Peter and John were going by the temple. They were going by the temple. And there was this man standing by the temple was crippled from his mother's womb. He was crippled from his mother's womb. And being crippled from his mother's womb, he laid there. And so Peter and John came by and, and he says, and, he, and, and, and so Peter said to him, silver and gold, he's looking, he's begging for something. He says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus of Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. He said, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, he showed the power of the name of Jesus to cause the crippled man to get up and walk. Jesus said, this is what believers can do. We see the apostle Paul. I want you to know this, that happened to Peter, not because he was Peter, but because he was a believer. 
Acts 16, 16 to 18. It says, now it happened as he went to prayer, speaking of Apostle Paul, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvage. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out at that very hour. He came out that very hour. Now understand, it is showing here that as believers, we have authority to command unclean spirits to come out. So you need to know that you have that authority by the name of Jesus. You have that authority by the name of Jesus. We have authority. We have authority. Number eight. Number eight. After you've prayed to God with thanksgiving and bind the devil, then you can loose or free yourself or your loved ones from his oppression by casting him out. Again, after you've prayed to God with thanksgiving and blind, bind the devil, I was going to say blind the devil, but bind the devil. <laughs> yeah, 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 blind the devil, blind him, yes, Lord. Then you can loose and free yourself and your loved ones from his oppression by casting them out. Matthew chapter 16, 18 to 20, it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, that word bind means to tie up on earth, will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, untie on earth, will be loosed, untied in heaven. So we have the backing of heaven. We have the backing of heaven. We have the backing of heaven to tie up the devil and to untie and release what we want. Mark chapter 3, 22 to 30 says, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the rule of the demons, he cast out demons. So Beelzebub was the ruler of the, uh, was the, ruler of the, of the demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan if... If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But he has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Now, I want you to know that that house that Jesus was talking about was the world. That the strong man's house, the world, this age had come under Satan's power. This age had come under Satan's influence. And so Jesus came into the devil's house because the devil controlled all the nations. The devil controlled all the kings. The devil had control over everybody. Pretty much everybody, everybody on this planet was under the, the devil's control. The Bible says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Literal, literally, the whole world is in bed with the devil. And so the whole world is in the devil's house. And Jesus says, you can't go into a strong man's house unless you first bind the strong man. That's the only way. You, you know, a strong man's not going to let you plunder his house. He's going to fight you. So the first thing you do when you get into the man's house, what do, the, what do thieves do? The first thing they do, they decapitate the house owners. They tie them up. And then they plunder that house. 
And so in order for you to plunder the devil's house, this house that is full of sickness, disease, death, fear, poverty, wars, famines, destruction, the only way that Jesus could have come in to the devil's house and cast out devils, caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, to raise the dead, he had to first bind the strong man. And he's saying that unless you bind the strong man, you can't plunder his goods. Unless you put a stop to what the devil is doing, you can't plunder his goods. That's the only way to plunder. That's the only way to plunder. Satan has stolen your health, your finances, your relationships, your children, your peace that God has already given you. And how does he do it? He tempts you with sickness. He tempts you with poverty and lack and depression and addictions and fear and all kinds of trouble. But you need to now plunder his house. And you've got to free yourself from sickness, free yourself from poverty, free yourself from fear, free yourself from addiction. Free yourself from trouble. Free yourself from anxiety and depression. You got to free yourself so that your health and peace and joy and finances and relationship and children that you have prayed for can manifest in your life. But you got to bind the devil. What does it mean? You got to tie him up. You got to say, no more. Devil, you can't kill me. Devil, you can't have my children. Devil, you can't have my husband. Devil, you can't have my wife. Devil, you can't have my health. Devil, you can't have my peace. Devil, you can't have my life. You can't have me. you got to open your mouth and talk to the devil. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Let's look at Luke chapter 13, 10 to 17 as we wind down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues of the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. That word loose there means to be fully free, completely free. Jesus said you are completely free from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now watch this. Was the woman free when Jesus, in the natural, in the natural, if you were looking at the woman, when Jesus said, woman, you are free from your infirmity, did she look free? No. It wasn't until he did what? Laid his hands on her. What was Jesus doing? He was calling those things that be not as though they were. In other words, how do you know you're free? Because Jesus said you're free. You're not free because you can stand up straight. You're not free because you don't have any poverty. You're not free because you're not experiencing sickness. You're not free because you're not experiencing any fear or any anxiety or depression. You're not free because there's no trouble in your life. You're free because Jesus said you're free. And whom the Son has made free is free indeed. You're not free because you look free. You're not free because you're no longer addicted to crack or addicted to cigarettes. You're free because Jesus said you're free. You're not healed because you don't have any pain. You're healed because Jesus said you're you're healed. She was still bent over. Jesus said, woman, you, not, not, not that you're going to be free. Jesus didn't say you're going to be free. He said, woman, you are free. She was still like this. She was still bent over. Couldn't straighten up. But Jesus said, woman, you are free. I want you to know it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It doesn't matter what you're hearing. It doesn't matter what the doctor said. Jesus said, woman, you are free. Man, you are free. It doesn't matter that you can't stand up. It doesn't matter you're still bent over. 
It doesn't matter that the devil still have you bound. You're free, not because you look free or feel free or can act free, but because I said you're free. And I want you to know that he laid his hands on her and that freedom was manifested. Now watch this. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite. Does not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose? his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, whom Satan has tied up, that's what the word there, that it's the word there, whom Satan has tied up. Think of it. Think of it. 18 years. Satan has her tied up. Should not, uh, not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has tied up, think of it, 18 years, be untied, be loosed, be untied from the bond on the Sabbath? And when he said all these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So Satan tied the woman up. But Jesus came to untie her. And how do we, what did Jesus do? What Jesus did was tie the devil up to untie the woman. And that understand that in order for us to untie ourselves from Satan's bondage, we got to tie the devil up first. I want you to know that every sickness is a bondage of the devil. Satan has you tied up with sickness, tied up with fear, tied up with addiction, tied up with trouble, tied up with poverty. You're tied up. But the only way to untie yourself, you've got to tie the devil up first. That's what it means to bind the devil. You tie them up. Once you tie somebody up, they can't move. They're not able to move. They're not able to do what they do. The devil's not able to make you sick anymore, make you afraid anymore, make you anxious or depressed anymore because you got them tied up. And then you can't get out of my house. Satan has bound you with sickness and fear and poverty and depression and trouble. It is time for you to free yourself. It is time for you to fully free yourself. It is it's time for you to bind the devil and command the devil to stop working in your life. You got to command the devil and say, devil, you get out of my life now. You stop working in my life now. You get out of my life. And you command that sickness to go from you. Command the devil to get out of you. You declare that you're free. You call yourself free. You call yourself free. You're free from cancer, free from diabetes, free from asthma, free from whatever trouble, free from, from infertility, free from depression, free from anxiety. You call yourself free. It doesn't matter if you look free, feel free, or talk free. You call yourself free. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions what I just taught? Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Let us stand. I want to give you an example of how you need to pray. Hallelujah. Just declare and say, in the name of Jesus, I declare that all authority in heaven and earth have been given to Jesus. And in Jesus' name, I have received all of his authority 
over all the power of the devil. Father, I thank you. You have delivered me from sickness. You have delivered me from fear. You have delivered me from anxiety and depression. Lord, you've delivered me out of every trouble. Thank you, Father, for your word declares that many are the troubles of the righteous, but you deliver them out of them all. I thank you, Lord. I'm delivered. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I am healed. Lord God, your word says that you have delivered me from out of all fear that have tormented me and set me free. Satan, I bind you. Satan, I declare that you have no more right in my life. You have stopped afflicting me with sickness. You have stopped afflicting me with fear. You have stopped afflicting me with anxiety. You have stopped afflicting me with trouble. By the name of Jesus, and by the name of Jesus, I declare I am free from all sickness. I am free from all fear. I am free from all trouble. I am free from all anxiety. In Jesus' name. I declare that whom the Son has made free is free indeed. And I thank you, Lord. I receive my forgiveness. I receive my healing. I receive my deliverance. I receive my deliverance. I thank you, Lord, that I am free. By Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen, 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 amen. How to stop the devil from hindering your prayers? I just showed you how to do it. I just showed you how to do it. And so I, I encourage you, watch this message. Get this in you. Because all that God has given you, you will never walk in it as long as you allow the devil to tie you up. As long as you allow the devil to have you bound. Like he bound that woman for 18 years. She couldn't stand straight up. The devil has bound many of you for years. You can't stand up. You can't stand up financially. You can't stand up for a, a, a health can't stand up in peace, you can't stand up in joy, you can't stand up in freedom and righteousness, you can't stand up. But you got to declare. See, before Jesus died, they were dependent upon Jesus healing them, but now that he's died and rose from the dead, you have that authority. Declare your freedom, declare that yourself untied, loosed, free from the devil's hold. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.